Oh, I'm really uh, delighted uh, that we have such an exciting interchange uh, planned for today uh, between Carol Gilligan giving our main talk with some comments also by uh, our very own Virginia Held. Uh, before that, I'd just very briefly like to, um, to mention a few uh, thank yous. First of all, the, the talk is co-sponsored by our seminar for Global Ethics and Politics, and this time also by the Social and Political Theory Student Association, uh, which is the leadership is uh, Joanna Tice and, of course, our very own John McMahon, who's our videographer, who has also been our assistant on the grant through the year. Uh, my co-director, uh, Ruth O'Brien, um, and her son, who's been uh, very helpful, not a co-director yet, but Max, thank you for your help with uh, all the various ev events. And in addition, uh, the other co-directors, um, Richard Wolin and Omar Dabur, also our um, Adam Attenson, our postdoc, who will be helping with the microphone afterwards, as will Josh Keaton and Adam McMahon. Thank you also for your uh, work here. Um, so, as you know, the very uh, eminent psychologist and theorist, general theorist of uh, human behavior, Carol Gilligan is our main speaker. She's a univer, and I will introduce uh, Virginia right before her own uh, comment. Carol Gilligan is university professor at NYU with affiliations in the School of Law, the Steinhardt School of Culture, Education and Human Development, and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Is that all? That's it. <laughs> um, her landmark book, In a Different Voice, uh, from 1982, is described by Harvard University Press as, quote, the little book that started a revolution, end quote. I would say it introduced a paradigm shift in the understanding of girls' development. That's the way I would put it. Um, following in a different voice, she initiated the Harvard Project on Women's Psychology and Girls' Development and co-authored or edited five books with her students, including Mapping the Moral Domain, Making Connections, Women, Girls, and Psychotherapy, Reframing Resistance, Meeting at the Crossroads on Women's Psychology and Girls' Development, and Between Voice and Silence, Women and Girls, Race and Relationships of 1995. She's also published I, I, as authored books, right? The Birth of Pleasure in 2002 and uh, The Deepening Darkness, Patriarchy, Resistance, and Democracy's Future, which was co-authored by David Richards. That was a CUP uh, Cambridge University Press book in 2009. Her most recent book is Joining the Resistance from Polity Press in 2011. Wow, that's quite a collection, very impressive. Um, she's received a Senior Research Scholar Award from the Spencer Foundation, a Grauermeyer Award for her contributions to education, a Heinz Award for her contributions to understanding the human condition, and she was named by Time Magazine in 1996 as one of the 25 most influential Americans. I would still rank you there, perhaps? Or Whatever that means, I don't know how they count. <laughs> she was a member of the Harvard faculty for over 30 years and in 1997 became Harvard's first professor of gender studies. Um, and in 1992, she was a visiting professor, Pitt Professor of American History and Institutions at Cambridge University. Um, just to give you a sense of her scope and range, her first novel called Kyra was published by Random House in 2008. And her play, The Scarlet Letter, co-authored with her son, Jonathan Gilligan, was presented at the Culture Project's Women's Center Stage Festival in New York City in 2005 and 2007. And it's now become the libretto for an opera entitled Pearl, which had its first workshop performance at Shakespeare and Company in the Berkshires in August of 2012. And if you happen to be in the Berkshires in August of 2013, on August 5th, you can hear uh, attend it there. Um, so, and the opera also will be part of a Chinese-American cultural exchange in Shanghai this March in two weeks uh, when you'll be uh, participating there. So, uh, without further ado, since we need to have time also for the comment and the discussion and then the reception, I'm so delighted to be able to introduce the 
fantastic, Carol Gilligan, giving a talk entitled, Reframing the Conversation About Difference, the Contribution of Care Ethics. Carol. Thank you. Thank you, Carol, for, for that beautiful introduction. Um, yeah, I am going to China with my opera in two weeks, which is sort of amazing. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Eva Kite, who really started, took care ethics into the philosophy right after In a Different Voice came out. Thank you, Paul Chevigny, my NYU colleague, and Barbara Milbauer, my friend, and Naomi Kalish, a rabbi and my student. <laughs> um, and thank you all. I told Carol and I told Virginia that this paper, I wrote this paper for this seminar, and it makes an integration that I hadn't made up until this year, which is really why I have not been part of the discussion of care ethics or really of ethics for a long time, with the slight exception of going to Paris to keynote a conference on care ethics at the Sorbonne, because there was very lively interest in care ethics and care work among French feminists, uh, philosophers and sociologists, um, that after I wrote In a Different Voice, I did a long project on, <laughs> which, which I thought of as sort of basically just straight psychology. Um, I went back and looked at development again, in part through the lens that I had come to in In a Different Voice, which is that the human sciences were framed in a way uh, that kept us from seeing parts of our humanity. I mean, it's very interesting to me that In a Different Voice is seen as being about girls because there's one girl in that book. It's a book that brings women's voices into a conversation about morality, about self, about relationships and development that women in psychology were not included in the research when these concepts were framed. And the question asked in, in a Different Voice, it's not a book about women's voices, it's not called In a Woman's Voice, is was the omission of women uh, basically trivial? I mean, could you leave out women and miss nothing of importance about human experience? That was the question asked. So I went back and did basically 15 years of research on girls' development than I did with my then graduate student, Judy Chu, a study of four and five-year-old boys. My former student, now my colleague and very close friend, Niobe Wei, has done research on adolescent boys. And there's a now complete kind of new look at development. And it was when my husband, Jim Gilligan, and I this fall went to hear Jonathan Shea, the psychiatrist who works with Vietnam combat vets, talk about moral injury that I realized that what I had been seeing and studying development was moral injury. Basically injuring the human capacity to act, I would say, carefully rather than carelessly in the human world. I have not written about that until this paper. So I said to, Virgi to Carol and to Virginia, it's a huge opportunity for me to read this paper to you because responses are really tremendously welcome for me, by me at this point. It's not published, it's just in process for me. So I really would appreciate what's clear and what's not clear and what you make sense of. But I just have to warn you, I am really an odd duck in this conversation, because I'm not a philosopher, <laughs> I'm not a political theorist, I'm someone who's really interested in human experience, so I'm a psychologist and I'm an artist. And you'll see, I will draw on psychological research and I'll also draw on the work of great artists who have looked at the human condition. So, having said that, um, it's 40 years now since John Berger wrote, quote, never again will a single story be told as though it's the only one. It's 30 years since In a Different Voice reframed the long-standing conversation about the self and morality 
as a conversation about voice and relationships. It's 15 years since Arundhati Roy, in her novel, The God of Small Things, coined the phrase love laws to name the laws that enforce, quote, who can be loved and how and how much. In the interim, a paradigm shift has been spreading through the human sciences. A growing body of evidence coming from developmental psychology, neurobiology, and evolutionary anthropology has cast what previously were taken as milestones of development in a new light. The separation of the self from relationships and the splitting of thought from emotion signal injury or responses to trauma what had been taken as milestones of development were manifestations of injury or trauma. The primatologist Franz Duval has called for, quote, a complete overhaul of assumptions about human nature based on the recognition that, quote, empathy is part of our evolutionary history and not just a recent part, but an age old capacity. The evolutionary anthropologist Sarah Blaffler Hurdy observes that the capacity for mutual understanding distinguishes us from our great ape ancestors and is linked to our survival as a species, is crucial actually for our survival, was and may well be, I would say, crucial to our survival as a species. Empathy, mind reading, these are Herdy's terms, by which she means the ability to discern the intentions of others and cooperation are wired into our nervous system and coded into our genes. The neurobiologist Antonio Damasio finds that our ability to register our experience from moment to moment is grounded in our bodies and in our emotions. In our bodies and our emotions, we pick up what Damasio calls, quote, the feeling of, or the music of what happens which then plays out in our minds and our thoughts. Now the significance of this is if you separate your mind from your body and your thoughts from your emotion, you lose touch with what you know through experience. The research that first sparked this shift in the understanding of who we are as humans started with listening to women. Women's capacity for empathy, for mutual understanding, and for what at the time was called, quote, women's intuition, remember that? <laughs> Had been at once idealized and devalued. Women were seen as either more or less than human, either like angels or like humans who hadn't quite developed insofar as we differed from men. Um, when researchers brought mothers into their studies of infants and observe babies not alone but in relationship, they saw, this is the 1980s, they saw an infant they had not imagined. From an early point in development, practically from birth, human babies engage responsively with others. They scan faces, make eye contact, and engage the attention of others. My colleague David Richards says he can see this most days on the subway. I mean, you have to just watch babies through this lens. What's more, <clears throat> they register the difference between the experience of relationship, that is being in touch with another person, and the appearance of relationship, that is when somebody who seems to be relating to the baby is in fact out of touch. As Daniel Stern observed, the human infant's world is an interpersonal world. Questions about development reverse. Rather than asking how do we gain the capacity to care, how do we learn to take the point of view of the other and overcome the pursuit of self-interest, we are prompted instead to ask how do we lose the capacity to care? What inhibits our ability to empathize with others and pick up the emotional climate around us? How do we fail to recognize the difference between being in and being out of touch with other people? And most painfully, how do we lose the capacity to love? 
With the paradigm shift, it becomes apparent that within ourselves, we have the requisites both for love and for democratic citizenship. Voice and the desire to live in relationships in here in our human nature, along with the capacity to spot false authority. The paradigm shift also reveals what had kept us from seeing who we are. The different voice sounded, quote, different because it joined reason with emotion and self with relationships. <clears throat> the interpretive, oh, because it was embodied, not disembodied, and located in time and place rather than speaking as if from nowhere. In other words, it was culturally located. The interpretive framework that had shaped psychological, moral, and political theory had been built on a gender binary and hierarchy that divided reason and self, masculine, from emotions and relationships, feminine, and elevated the masculine over the feminine. The presence of emotion and the concern with relationships made the different voice sound, quote, feminine. And gave, given the binary, it made it hard to hear its intelligence and its agency. In other words, if it was emotional and relational, it couldn't be intelligent and couldn't be agentic. Was the, um, <clears throat> the binary and hierarchy led justice, masculine, to be separated from and elevated over caring, feminine, which became a matter of special obligations and relegated to the private sphere. The different voice challenged the framework and revealed how the binary and hierarchy were blinding us to our humanity, in a sense, making both men and women half humans. With the paradigm shift, the different voice no longer sounds different. It sounds like a human voice. <clears throat> the fight driving the culture wars is a fight over the framework. As President Obama said in the recent US election, quote, this election offers the American people the choice between two very different visions of our future. Are you on your own or are we in it together? Are you alone or are we interdependent? The reality is we're in it together because as the poet W.H. Auden reminded us, no one exists alone. Hunger allows no choice to the citizen or the police. We must love one another or die. I will begin with a discussion of moral injury, then turn to when and how and why our capacity for love and mutual understanding becomes injured or stunted, how the injury becomes invisible or read as natural, and how it can be resisted. Finally, I will take up the love laws as no small thing and not a private matter. In constraining love, it constrains human capacities that are integral to relationships and thus to democratic citizenship. As the battles over the love laws make plain, the culture wars are a fight between democracy and patriarchy. In doing the research for our book, The Deepening Darkness, Patriarchy, Resistance, and Democracy's Future, David Richards and I discovered that across time and cultures, beginning in the Rome of Augustus and continuing into the present, the strengthening and more rigid enforcement of the love laws. <clears throat> I mean, just think about the whole fight about gay marriage, the whole fight about birth control, and so forth. This is what the love laws are about, I mean, not to mention all the racial and the sexual and so forth. Um, <clears throat> beginning Across time and cultures, beginning in the Rome of Augustus and continuing to the present, the strengthening and more rigid enforcement of the love laws was associated with the suppression of ethical resistance to injustice. And conversely, think of the 60s, the freeing of love from the love laws of patriarchy was associated again across time and cultures with freeing an ethical voice that resists injustice. Ironically, the love laws in the name of love lead us to act cruelly rather than carefully in navigating the human social world. The ethic of care in its concern with voice and relationships 
is the ethic of love and of democratic citizenship. It is also the ethic of resistance to moral injury. Part one, moral injury. In Achilles in Vietnam, Jonathan Shea writes about moral injury. As a psychiatrist working with Vietnam combat veterans, he recognized in their post-traumatic stress disorder the signs of an injury that had not been detected. A shattering of trust had followed the betrayal of, quote, what's right in a high-stakes situation with the sanction of legitimate authority. Shea finds that healing from trauma depends on, quote, communalization of the trauma, meaning being able safely to tell the story to someone who is listening and who can be trusted to retell it truthfully to others in the community. So, he writes, quote, before analyzing, before classifying, before thinking, before trying to do anything, we should listen. Here's an example of moral injury. The veteran was a member of a long-range reconnaissance patrol that killed innocent civilians, quote, a lot of fishermen and kids, on an intelligence error. The veteran says, quote, what got us thoroughly fucking confused is at the time you turn to the team and you say to the team, don't worry about it, everything's fucking fine because that's what you're getting from upstairs. The fucking colonel says, don't worry about it, we'll take care of it. You know, uh, we got body count, we have body count. So it starts working in your head, it starts working on your head. So you know in your heart it's wrong, but at the time here's your superiors telling you that it's okay. So I mean, that's okay then, right? This is part of war. They wanted to give us a fucking unit citation, them fucking maggots. A lot of medals came down from it. The lieutenants got medals, and I know the colonel got his fucking medal, and they would have award ceremonies, you know, I'd be standing like a fucking jerk and they'd be handing out fucking medals for killing civilians. Just listen, the veterans say, when telling mental health professionals what they need to know to work with them. Just listen means to take in the story before trying to make sense of it. Because carefully listened to, the story actually, stories actually don't make sense. They are stories about a quote, confusion that starts, quote, working on your mind, where something, quote, you know in your heart is wrong, is, quote, okay. And it's not only not okay, but rewarded with medals of honor. In the words of one veteran, these stories are sacred stuff. All too often, Shea finds, our mode of listening deteriorates into intellectual sorting, with the professional grabbing the veteran's words from the air and sticking them into, quote, mental bins. We assume we know what we're hearing, that we don't really have to listen, that we've heard it all before. And as Shea says, we resemble museum goers whose whole experience consists of mentally saying, quote, that's Cubist, that's El Greco, and who never see anything they've looked at. As Shea writes, listening in this way destroys trust. I'm struck by Shea's observations about listening because they so closely parallel the approach I have taken in my research. Listening in a way that creates trust was crucial to hearing a, quote, different voice, meaning a voice that didn't make sense when stuck into the prevailing mental bins. The importance of a specific mode of listening to the process of discovery led my graduate students and I to develop a listening guide to specify a sequence of steps that make it possible to hear what you're listening to without resorting to intellectual sorting, and thus which open the interpretive framework rather than feeding what you hear right back into what you already know or the way you already see the world. But I was also startled by the resonances I found in Shea's description of moral injury. In the very different context of studying development, my colleagues and I also observed a shattering of trust and social withdrawal following a betrayal of what's right in a high-stakes situation where the betrayal was culturally sanctioned. 
In speaking of what's right, Shea observes that, quote, no single English word takes in the whole sweep of a culture's definition of right and wrong. We use terms such as moral order, convention, normative expectations, ethics, and commonly understood social values. The ancient Greek word that Homer used, themis, encompasses all these meanings. What's right is Shea's equivalent of themis, and its colloquial phrasing captures more closely than words like, quote, moral order or ethics, the sense of an inner compass we carry with us that alerts us when we've lost our way or when we're doing something that we know in our hearts is wrong. The research that led to the observation of something akin to moral injury began with studies of girls' development that I initiated with my graduate students in the early 1980s after completing In a Different Voice. The studies illuminate an intersection of development which occurs in girls' lives at adolescence where an inner compass points one way and the highway signs in another. Girls had to throw away their compasses in order to follow the prescribed route with conviction. In their reluctance to do so, my research team and I saw a resistance that was associated with psychological resiliency. But the intersection itself was marked by confusion because at this juncture in development, the very meaning of, quote, what's right is shifting. The right way to go is not the right way to go. This tension between psychological truth or psychological health and cultural adaptation became manifest as a crisis in connection. In the words of 16-year-old Iris, if I were to say what I was feeling and thinking, no one would want to be with me my voice would be too loud. And then she added by way of explanation, but you have to have relationships. So I agree. And I say to her, but if you're not saying what you're feeling and thinking, then where are you in these relationships? I mean, Iris has given up relationship in order to have relationships, muting her voice so that, quote, she can be with other people. She saw the paradox in what she was saying. And just, I'm interested in how you imagine this iris I'm describing, because she happened to be the valedictorian of her high school class, admitted to the competitive college of her first choice. So this sacrifice of voice and relationship in order to have a self that other people want to be with, that have, quote, relationships, was extremely adaptive. It was rewarded socially and rewarded in the educational system. How could one stay in touch with oneself, with one's heart and voice, and live in relationship with others? How could, but how could one live in relationships with others if one lost one's voice and one's heart? Or, as Judy, a reflective 13-year-old, put it, if you forget your mind. Your mind, Judy says, pointing to her gut, is, quote, associated with your heart and your soul and your internal feelings and your real feelings. Her experience of an initiation that carries with it the risk of losing your mind is sent I mean, it's amazing, these phrases that kids use. I mean, if you, this is what, you know, like, if you start to listen, this is what you, you hear. Because it seems like you don't expect a 13-year-old to talk about losing your mind but that's what she's talking about and her strategy for not. So the, an initiation that carries with it the risk of losing your mind is centrally bound up with the question of what's right and what's wrong. Facing the quandary of how to stay in touch with what she knows within herself and as she says, how you are brought up, she separates her mind not from her body but from her brain, which she locates in her head and associates with her intelligence, her smartness, and her education. People, Judy says, can control what they're teaching you and say this is right and this is wrong. That's control like into your brain. But the feeling is just with you. The feeling can't be changed by someone else who wants it to be this way. It can't be changed by saying, quote, no, this is wrong, this is right, this is wrong. 
As the interview draws to a close, Judy states her theory of development. Quote, I think that maybe really young children have mind more than anyone else because I don't know, they don't have much of a brain. And I think that's when you get all your mind stuff because that's the only thing you really have then because then you transform some of the mind things to the brain so then that starts to evolve. And that's sort of like the way you are brought up. It goes into your brain. And I think that after a while you just sort of forget your mind because everything is being shoved at you into your brain. Judy is 13, a reflective eighth grader, struggling with dissociation and arriving at a creative solution for holding on to what she knows. She contends with a voice that carries the force of moral authority and would lead her to forget her mind, a voice she experiences as intrusive and controlling. You can forget your mind, she says, but the, quote, deeper sort of knowing, the knowing she associates with her heart and her soul, and her real thoughts and feelings can't be changed by somebody saying, no, this is wrong, this is right. However forceful the initiation, however linked with smartness, intelligence, and education, and all they imply, the quote, feeling is just with you a gut knowing, buried perhaps, but not lost. I think of Judy when I read about people who took great risks under the Nazis. Magda Trocme, the pastor's wife in Le Chambon sur Lignon, who responded when Jews knocked on her door by saying, come in. Antonia Zabinska, the zookeeper's wife in occupied Warsaw, who hid Jews in the zoo in the center of the city. And Jan Zabinski, the zookeeper, who led Jews out of the Warsaw ghetto under the eyes of the Nazis. When asked how they came to do this, what they say is they were human. They did what any person would have done. As Zabinski tells the press after he and Antonia were recognized at Yad Vashem as righteous among nations, quote, it was not an act of heroism, just a simple human obligation. The research on development gives a slightly different slant to Shea's writings about moral injury. It picks up on something the veteran said, that he knew in his heart it's wrong. Deep assumptions of what's right and wrong, what's praiseworthy and blameworthy are rooted in basic human capacities. This explains Che's title, Achilles in Vietnam. Quote from Che, the specific content of the Homeric warrior's themis was often quite different from that of the American soldiers in Vietnam. But what has not changed in three millennia are violent rage and social withdrawal when deep assumptions of what's right are violated. We live in bodies and in cultures, but we also have a psyche, a voice and a capacity for resistance. The response of the psyche to moral injury across three millennia and different cultures was rage and social withdrawal. And also, as Shea describes, going berserk, going crazy, because something has happened that psychologically doesn't make sense. Part two, a triptych of development. The word betrayal appears repeatedly in Niobe Way's book, Deep Secrets. It is used by the adolescent boys in her studies to explain why they no longer have a best friend, why they don't tell their secrets to anyone anymore. The betrayal itself is never quite specified Justin describes it as something that, quote, just happens. He doesn't know if it's, quote, natural or whatever. But the shattering of trust is unmistakable. As Joseph says, quote, you can't trust nobody these days. Something has happened. Justin was among the majority of boys in Way's studies, boys from a range of cultural backgrounds, Latino, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Chinese, African-American, Anglo, Muslim, Russian, etc., who, quote, spoke about having and wanting intimate male friendships and then gradually losing these relationships and their trust in their male peers. As a freshman and sophomore in high school, Mohammed spoke of telling his best friend all his secrets. When interviewed as a junior, he says, I don't know. Recently, you know, I kind of changed something. Not that much, but you know, I feel like there's no need to. I could keep my feelings to myself. You know, I'm mature enough. 
Fernando echoes his sentiment. Asked what he sees as an ideal friendship, he begins, quote, you gotta be funny, truthful. I just gotta have fun with you, you know. But then he says, more haltingly and with a question, um, you gotta, I guess, just be there for me? I don't wanna, I guess I don't wanna sound too sissy-like. I think I've matured in certain ways. I know how to be more of a man. In the early years of high school, the boys resist the gender binary that makes it sissy-like to depend on someone and want them to be, to quote, just be there for me. But by the end of high school, as Way notes, emotional intimacy and vulnerability have a gender, girly, and a sexuality, gay. Being a man then means being emotionally stoic and independent. The boys have internalized a gender binary and hierarchy where being a man means not being a woman or like a woman and also being on top. With this internalization, trust is shattered. What had previously seemed unimpeded to these boys, the love they experienced with their best friends, the quote, trust, respect, and love that Justin says is so deep it's within you it just happens, it's human nature. This has become fraught. Something has been betrayed, but the boys don't know if the betrayal is natural or whatever. Yet the boys in way studies do know the value of close friendships. George observes that without a best friend to tell your secrets to, quote, you would go wacko. Chen says that without a close friend, quote, you go crazy. Others describe how anger builds up inside them when they don't have a best friend to talk to. Some speak of sadness, loneliness, and depression. The research with girls, the central panel of the triptych, depic depicts the mechanism of betrayal, how it is enacted by a series of separations that create psychic rifts. The head is divided from the heart, the mind from the body, and the embodied voice, the voice that speaks in connection with body and emotion, and thus with the, quote, feeling of what happens, becomes separated from relationships. Tanya, at 16, reflects, the voice that stands up for what I believe in has been buried deep inside me. She's preserving a voice with integrity within herself, but its public silence compromises her relationships and her ability to participate as a citizen in a democratic society. Articulate girls such as Tanya and Judy describe their strategies of resistance. Splitting your mind from your education, taking an honest voice underground. They illuminate the depths of the dilemma when it becomes seemingly impossible to have a voice and to live in relationships some form of psychic splitting becomes inevitable. I don't know was the phrase girls used repeatedly following this initiation. In other words, the word don't had come to stand between I and no, the internalization of a prohibition on knowing with what them, in themselves they don't know, they knew. Just as the boys in Way's study would say, I don't care that the word don't had come to stand between I and care. And yet girls do know and boys do care, although they may need not to know this. The internalization of the gender binary and hierarchy of a patriarchal order, however it may be called, forces dissociation. The binary creates splits in the psyche and the hierarchy undermines integrity and trust. So as a healthy body resists infection, a healthy psyche resists this initiation. It resists moral injury, a betrayal of oneself and of relationships that is culturally sanctioned and thereby often mistaken for development and educationally rewarded. To appreciate what this initiation does to the psyche, one only has to listen to girls before it sets in. 11-year-old Elise, a sixth grader in an urban public school, in a conversation about whether or not it's ever good to tell a lie, says, quote, my house is wallpapered with lies. I always think of that when people say, we want girls to have their voices. I think, really? <laughs> because when I went to her house to get a permission slip signed, 
I saw what she was seeing and also saw her watching me see it. A scene of domestic tranquility, the wallpaper, was covering an explosive sexual triangle. Elise's voice is the voice of countless girls around this age in novels written across, and plays, I should say, written across time and culture. At the beginning of Jane Eyre, Jane, age 10, tells her Aunt Reed, quote, you said I was a liar, I'm not. If I were, I'd have said, I, if I were, I'd have said I loved you, and I don't. People think you're good, but you're bad and hard-hearted, I will let everyone know what you have done. I mean, you see why people want to silence this voice. It's the voice of Iphigenia at the beginning of Euripides' tragedy, of Scout in To Kill a Mockingbird, of Frankie in Member of the Wedding, of Rahel in The God of Small Things, Claudia in The Bluest Eye, Tambu in Tsitsi Dangaremba's Nervous Conditions, Annie John, the list is endless. We know this voice, and yet it always strikes us as surprising. The voice is culturally inflected, but strikingly recognizable. A girl at the edge of an initiation says what she is facing. Children must be corrected, Aunt Reed tells Jane. Jane responds, deceit is not my fault. Frank and fearless, honest and direct, this is a voice girls are pressured to silence, to cover. They come to call it, in Anne Frank's words, insufferable, or, quote, unpleasant, or, as 13-year-old Tracy says, quote, stupid, meaning it has come to sound or to seem stupid to speak honestly. Iris hears the voice that says what she is thinking and feeling as, quote, too loud. Once this voice is muted or held in silence, its absence readily goes undetected. People tend not to ask, where is that voice? For example, millions of readers read Aunt, the diary of Anne Frank without noticing that they were reading not Anne's actual diary, but a version of the diary that Anne had edited after hearing in March of 44 over Radio Free Orange that the Dutch government had plans to set up a war museum and was interested in diaries, letters, and collections of sermons that would show how the Dutch people carried on their lives under the extreme conditions of the war. Anne knew that, you know, I mean, Anne knew what she was doing and why. She wanted her diary to be in the museum. And in fact, it's her edited version of the diary that was published as the diary of a young girl. As um, the poet even Bolin though, reminds us, what we lost is here in this room on this veiled evening. In other words, the brilliance of dissociation as a response to trauma is that what is dissociated, held out of awareness, is not lost, it is still with us. When association unlocks dissociation, then sensation of coming upon something that is once familiar and surprising, something you know and don't know that you knew. In When Boys Become, quote, Boys, Judy Chu brings the eye of a naturalist to observing four and five-year-old boys. I mean, the girl's work showed when girls become, quote, girls. I mean, and the short way of saying is when they cease being humans and become, quote, girls. But this, when boys become, quote, boys, of course, the same thing. When boys stop being humans and become, quote, boys. Judy Chu brings the eye of a naturalist to observing four- and five-year-old boys. She follows them from pre-kindergarten through kindergarten and into first grade. And she sees them becoming, quote, boys. The boys who had been so articulate, so attentive, so authentic and direct at four and five in their relationships with one another and with her were gradually becoming more inarticulate, more inattentive, more inauthentic and indirect with one another and with her. They were becoming, quote, boys. 
Chu sees their resistance in a strategic concealment of their capacity for empathy, their emotional intelligence and sensitivity, their desire for closeness. Boys' relational capacities are not lost. Rather, boys' socialization toward cultural constructions of masculinity that are defined in opposition to femininity seems mainly to force a split between what boys know about themselves, their relationships in their world, and what boys show. Winning the boys' trust, Chu learns about the Mean Team, a club created, quote, by the boys and for the boys and for the stated purpose of acting against the girls. The Mean Team established a masculinity defined in opposition to and as the opposite of a femininity associated with being good and nice. Thus, the main activity of the Mean Team was to, quote, bother people. That's a quote from a five-year-old boy. Listening to boys, Chu comes to the insight that the very relational capacities boys learn to shield, the empathy and emotional sensitivity that lead them to read the human world around them so accurately and so astutely, uh, are essential if they are to realize the closeness they now seek with other boys. The irony is that in blunting or concealing these capacities in order to be one of the boys, they render that closeness unattainable. It's in this light that you see the resistance of the, the 13, 14, the early high school boys in Niobe Way's study. In the epilogue to 13 Ways of Looking at a Man, the psychoanalyst Donald Moss tells a story about his experience in first grade. Every week they learned a new song and were told that at the end of the year they would each have a chance to lead the class in singing their favorite, which they were to keep secret. For Moss, the choice was clear. Quote, the only song I loved was the lullaby. When at night I go to sleep, 13 angels watch to keep from Hansel and Gretel. Every night he would sing it to himself, and like the song said, the angels came, saving him from his night terrors and enabling him to fall asleep. It was, quote, and would always be the most beautiful song I had ever heard. They had learned the song in early autumn, and in late spring, when his turn came, he stood in front of the class. The teacher asked what song he, has chose, he had chosen. Moss remembers, quote, I began to tell her, it's the lullaby. But immediately, out of the corner of my eye, I saw the reaction of the boys in the front row. Their faces were lighting up in shock. I knew, knew in a way that was immediate, clear, and certain that what I was about to do, the song I was about to choose, the declaration that I was about to make represented an enormous, irrevocable error. What the boys were teaching me was that I was to know now and to always have known that when at night I go to sleep could not be my favorite song, that a lullaby had no place here, that something else was called for. In a flash, in an act of gratitude, not to my angels, but to my boys, I changed my selection. I smiled at the teacher, told her I was just kidding, told her I would now lead the class in singing the Marines hymn, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Moss writes that his book can be, quote, thought of as an extended effort to unpack that moment in front of the class and indirectly to apologize to the angels for my treachery. He had been, quote, unfaithful to them, had, quote, renounced them in public and continued to do so for many years. The residue was a melancholia tied to the boy's awareness that, quote, this is Moss, what he is, quote, really doing in that fateful turning outward is simultaneously preserving and betraying his original love of angels, affirming and denying his new love of boys. After all, now he and the boys are joined together in looking elsewhere for the angels they might have all once had. Yet, as Moss writes, in spite of his treachery, the angels, quote, are still there. Moss had betrayed his love, and he had also betrayed his knowledge. And he gives a stunningly precise description of how initiation works, how it alters the psyche and leads to a rewriting of history. What the boys were teaching him was that, quote, I was to know now and to always have known 
that a lullaby could not be my favorite song, and yet it was, and quote, would always be. Part three, the love laws. In an overlooked passage midway through Anna Karenina, we hear the hushed voice of Karenin. Quote, prior to the day when he saw his dying wife, he had not known his own heart. Tolstoy's novel, like Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter, takes us into the territory of the love laws. We see the politics. In The Scarlet Letter, the word, quote, patriarchy appears repeatedly. Quote, patriarchal privilege, quote, patriarchal personage, quote, patriarchal power, along with a portrait of, quote, the father of the custom house, the patriarch. Quote, he had, this is Hawthorne, he had no soul, no heart, no mind. He resembles Karenin, also an official, a, quote, public functionary of the government. The figures of Anna Karenina and Hester Prynne are so dazzling, so vibrant, that our eye fixes on them. They stand out among the women, the, quote, good wives, who are gray and muted by comparison. Anna and Hester are women who break the love laws, driven by a, quote, lawless passion. We want to know what happens to them. It is almost as if they serve to distract us from seeing what Tolstoy and Hawthorne are showing us about what happens to men in patriarchy. The names of Hawthorne's central male characters, Dimsdale and Chillingworth, give us a clue. The scarlet letter so rivets our attention that we may miss the implicit questions, how does a man of worth Mr. Chillingworth, become chilling. How does a man of nature, Mr. Dimsdale, become dim? It's Tolstoy who takes us to the core. Anna is due to give birth to the child she conceived with her lover, Vronsky. Deathly ill, she sends a telegram to her husband, begging him to come and to forgive her so she can die in peace. He assumes it's a trick and feels only contempt. Yet, he's concerned that if he doesn't go, and she should die, it would, quote, not only be cruel, and everyone would condemn me, but it would be stupid on my part. So he went. Readers often forget, or don't quite take in, that at this juncture in the novel, Karenin offers Anna both her freedom and her son, I should say their son. He will divorce her and by taking the disgrace upon himself make it possible for her to go out into society and to keep Serioza with her. As it turns out, Anna does not take the offer. Her decision is unexplained. In a novel we, where we are told even what the dog thinks, Anna's refusal to take her freedom, which seals her fate, is told cryptically in a short paragraph, quote, a month later, Alexei Alexandrovich was left alone in his apartment with his son, and Anna went abroad with Vronsky without obtaining a divorce and resolutely abandoning the idea. We are told, however, in detail, we are, however, told in detail what happened to Karenin when at his wife's bedside, quote, he had given himself for the first time in his life to that feeling of tender compassion which other people's suffering evoked in him and which he had previously been ashamed of as a bad weakness. He suddenly felt, quote, not only relief from his suffering but also an inner peace that he had never experienced before. He suddenly felt that the very thing that had once been the source of his suffering had become the source of his spiritual joy that what had seemed insoluble when he condemned, reproached, and hated became simple and clear when he forgave and loved. Anna doesn't die. Karenin forgives Vronsky. He tells him, quote, you may trample me in the mud, make me the laughing stock of society. I will not abandon her. I will never say a word of reproach to you. 
My duty is clearly ordained for me. I must be with her, and I will be. If she wishes to see you, I will let you know. Karenin settles into the household and begins to observe the people around him, the wet nurse, the governess, and his son. He regrets that he hadn't paid much attention to him. Now he, quote, stroked the boy's hair with his hand. For the newborn little girl, quote, he had some special feeling, not only of pity, but also of tenderness. He did not know how he came to love her. But it was he who looked after her so she wouldn't die. He, quote, went to the nursery several times a day and sat there for a long while watching her carefully. Quote, he would sometimes spend half an hour silently gazing at the saffron red downy wrinkled cheek of the sleeping baby and, quote, felt utterly at peace and in harmony with himself and saw nothing extraordinary in his situation, nothing that needed to be changed, end quote. But, quote, the more time passed, the more he clearly saw that natural as the situation was for him, he would not be allowed to remain in it. He felt that beside the good spiritual force that had guided his soul, there was another force, crude and equally powerful, if not more so, that guided his life, and that this force would not give him the humble peace he desired. He felt that everybody looked at him with questioning surprise, not understanding him and expecting something from him. Over a stretch of 15 pages, Tolstoy repeats the phrases crude force, powerful force, mysterious force, as though to make sure they stay in our mind like Vronsky's strong white teeth. In the face of this force, Karenin feels powerless. Quote, he knew beforehand that everything was against him and that he would not be allowed to do what now seemed to him so natural and good, but would be forced to do what was bad, but which seemed to them the proper thing. What is, quote, natural and good thus becomes, in the eyes of the world, quote, bad and improper. The crude, powerful, mysterious force, which, quote, contrary to his inner mood, guided his life, demanding the carrying out of its will, that led Karenin to feel ashamed about, quote, that feeling of tender compassion which other people's suffering evoked in him and to regard it as a bad weakness is patriarchy with its gender binary and hierarchy and love laws. Anna had broken the love laws, but in doing so, she freed love, her own, and as it turned out, also Karenin's. We learn that Karenin had been an orphan, his childhood bleak. His pursuit of status and honor appears in this light as an attempt to fill a void within him. He was a man afraid of feeling, cut off from love, ashamed of his humanity. Until suddenly, also a repeated word in this passage, his heart opens in response to Anna and the baby, an opening he experiences as, quote, simple, clear, natural, and good. He writes to Anna, quote, tell me yourself what will give you true happiness and peace in your soul. Reversing the patriarchal hierarchy, he says, quote, I give myself over entirely to your will and your sense of justice. In this moment, they appear simply human. He, with the emotions of tenderness and compassion, she with will and a sense of justice. But the world they live in is ruled by a crude force. Karenin sacrifices his love. Anna sacrifices her will and her desire for freedom. And with these sacrifices, the tragedy becomes inescapable. Once Anna leaves without obtaining a divorce, once she gives up the freedom she wanted and that could have made her life with Bronsky viable, enabling her, like him, to go out into society and not separating her from her son, it's a straight line to her death under the train. Love is the force that has the power to upset a patriarchal order. Crossing its boundaries in Roy's, Rindity Roy's novel, an untouchable man touches a touchable woman. It dismantles its hierarchies of race, class, caste, sexuality, and gender. But as Tolstoy shows us, 
patriarchy leads men not to know their hearts and to regard their human capacities for empathy and understanding as, quote, bad weaknesses. The privileged position of men in patriarchy can blind us from seeing what these novelists show us. The devoted resistance, the resistance that comes from within rather than from someone who stands outside the culture, is the resistance of Vronsky, who repeatedly turns down offers to rejoin his regiment and rise in the hierarchy, choosing instead to be with Anna. In this respect, he's like Shakespeare's Antony, who speaking of Egypt and Cleopatra says, <clears throat> quote, let Rome in Tiber melt, here is my place. Dimsdale, Hester's lover and the father of Pearl is also a resistor by nature. Quote, by the constitution of his nature, he loved the truth and loathed a lie as few men ever did. Quote, living a lie, uh, living a lie, quote, he loathed his miserable self. Chillingworth, compared to the devil, the embodiment of evil as he preys on Dimsdale's soul, is also the person in the novel who observes that Hester should not stand alone in her shame and who in the end leaves all his fortune, which is considerable, we are told, to Pearl, who is not his daughter. Tolstoy and Hawthorne tell a dominant story. They show us the price of freeing love within a patriarchal order, but also the costs of its containment. In the hushed voices of the men, we hear about moral injury. When they are forced to betray what's right in a high stakes situation, when masculinity and honor are on the line, are at stake, where the betrayal appears in the eyes of the world, proper and good. Love, Hawthorne writes, quote, whether newly born or aroused from a death-like slumber must always create sunshine, filling the heart so full of radiance that it overflows upon the outward world. He also observes that, quote, no man for any considerable period can wear one face to himself and another to the multitude without finally getting bewildered as to which may be the true. Conclusion. It's difficult in this postmodern age to speak of an honest voice or true face. And, is, and in reality, we have within us many voices. Our stories are multiple. Without psychology, without an awareness of voice and resistance, the conversation about cultural differences and democratic citizenship tends to go around in circles as we seek to weigh in the abstract the relative values of equality and toleration and debate the question as to whether we can uphold the value of liberty, of freedom, and also maintain a commitment to equality. I have suggested that some stories are more equal than others in their alignment with human psychology. I have shown that within patriarchal cultures, there's a tension between human nature and the structures of hierarchy that forces, splits in the psyche, a masculinity and a femininity established through a betrayal of love inflict moral injury, and the ethic of care guides our resistance. Sarah Hurdy observes that the patriarchal family is neither traditional nor original in an evolutionary sense. Like exclusive maternal care, it is at odds with the imperative of imperatives of survival. Quote, Patri this is Hurdy, patriarchal ideologies that focused on the chastity of women and the perpetuation and augmentation of male lineages undercut the long-standing priority of putting children's well-being first. Seen in this light, care is a feminist, not a feminine ethic. And feminism, guided by an ethic of care, is perhaps the most profoundly radical in the sense of going to the roots, liberation movement in human history. Freed from the gender binary and hierarchy, feminism is not an issue of women or a battle between women and men. It is the movement to free democracy from patriarchy. The Laguna Pueblo poet and scholar Paula Gunn Allen writes, quote, the root, the root of oppression is the loss of memory. The moral injury patriarchy inflicts on both men and women leads to a loss of memory and a rewriting of history so we forget what we know. It is the root of an oppression that has had moral sanction and hence was a site of moral injury. 
in a different voice, located the pivot in women's development that follows the recognition that self-sacrifice or selflessness, long seen as the epitome of feminine goodness, is in fact morally problematic. My interviews with women who were considering abortion took place in the immediate aftermath of the Supreme Court decision in Roe v. Wade. When the highest court in the land gave women a decisive voice, it encouraged women to scrutinize the sacrifice of voice they had made in the name of goodness. Janet, one of the women in In a Different Voice, articulates the shift in her thinking when concerns about goodness become joined with a concern about truth. The criterion for judgment shifts when the morality of action is assessed, not in the abstract or on the basis of its appearance in the eyes of others, but in terms of the realities of its intention and consequence. As Janet says, you have to know what you're doing. You have to be, quote, truthful, not hiding anything bringing out all the feelings involved before you can know if it's a, quote, good decision and an honest one, a real decision. The pivot in men's development comes when they realize they have been living a lie and have betrayed their love. The love laws are no small thing, and we need to fight them, not acquiesce in the separation of, quote, women's human rights from human rights or relegate women to a special sphere where equality becomes uncertain and rights don't quite apply. The research with girls has a central place in the triptych because girls are like canaries in mines. When they stop speaking, when they no longer say what they're seeing, we know we're in trouble. Because of the later timing of girls' initiation, their voices are a correction to mistaking culture for nature. They name the gaps between how things are and how things are said to be. Boys and men know this as well, but for a variety of reasons having to do with codes of male honor and privilege, it may be more difficult for them to say it. The ability of articulate girls to narrate an initiation that leads to moral injury communalizes the trauma and opens the way to healing. In their book, Are You Not a Man of God? It's a forthcoming book. Tova Hartman and Charlie Buckholtz examine the resistance that arises within a tradition, in part out of devotion to the tradition. Their point is that social criticism does not have to come from outside. They focus on stories about people in relationship to people in positions of power and take the vantage point of these supporting characters as their lens for reading traditional stories. They note that a patriarchal tradition that demands a willingness to betray love, think of Abraham, Agamemnon, contains within itself voices that resist this betrayal. The supporting characters argue with their fathers, with their husbands, mothers, brothers, and friends. They encounter people with whom they have close relationships, usually people in power, people who are meant to heroically embody the highest cultural values, including the values of family, relationships, and love, in the act of transgressing these very values. And thus we see within traditions the very tensions we have been examining when cultural sanction is given to betrayals that shock us. In a passage resonant with Shea, Hartman, and Buckholz observe that the reactions of these supporting characters, quote, to the trauma of these bewildering transgressions tend to be visceral and vivid. The sudden forced awareness of deep moral fissures in their friends, family, and cultural meaning networks is often presented as a jarring contradiction to their deepest held understandings, value assumptions that have become so thoroughly assimilated that they are barely, if at all, distinguishable from the self. These supporting characters are the canon's neutron bombs, the identity-shattering explosions detonated at the margins of traditional narratives. They resist those in power even as they hold on devotedly to their relationships to those they resist. 
Intriguingly, the carriers of culture, the shapers of the canon, deemed this type of resistance, resistance we might say through the medium of relationship, worthy of holding on to, end quote. By recasting the traditional discussion of the self and of morality as a conversation about voice or voices and relationships, and by adopting a voice-centered methodology, I have opened a space for reframing the conversation about differences and also about resistance. Voice does not exist outside of the context of relationship and is thus inherently multiple, changing in resonance depending on the relational acoustics. Identity, rather than envisioned as something singular and stable, becomes more subtle and dynamic. Voice is one of the primary currencies through which identity is not only expressed, but formed and reformed. As with identity, so with culture, cultures, their edges are jagged rather than flush. Voice implies a speaker, both a speaker and a listener, someone who listens and hears, who takes in what has been spoken. The recognition of difference is the experience of relationship. There's not one voice or one story. Equal voice is the condition for free and open debate. One way to move beyond old arguments about moral truth versus cultural relativism is to begin by talking about listening, listening in a way that creates rather than destroys trust, then talk about moral injury and the ethic of care that can guide us in preventing the betrayal of what's right, and finally, recognize that there are voices that transcend culture, and although they may be veiled or hidden or at the margins, these voices may hold the power to transform the conversation. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I'm sorry it's not louder, I don't know. Um, Anyway, um, we'll move right away to our comments. Thank you so much for that provocative and extremely interesting talk. Um, so I would like to um, introduce our commentator, uh, distinguished professor emerita in philosophy at the Graduate Center in Hunter College, Virginia Held. Uh, she's published numerous monographs, including most recently, I think most recently, How Terrorism is Wrong. Morality and Political Violence from OUP in 2008, and going backward in time, The Ethics of Care, Personal, Political, and Global, also from OUP in 2006, Feminist Morality, Transforming Culture, Society, and Politics, also the earlier Rights and Goods, Justifying Social Action, and The Public Interest and Individual Interests, in basic books in 1972. Her edited works include Justice and Care, Essential Readings in Feminist Ethics, Property, Profits, and Economic Justice, and Philosophy, Morality, and International Affairs. She's published over 30 book chapters and over 50 articles in scholarly journals. She is a past president of the Eastern Division of the American Philosophical Association, winner in 2003 of the James Wilbur Award for Extraordinary Contributions to the Appreciation and Advancement of Human Values, the Hunter College Presidential Award for Excellence in Scholarship, the Distinguished Women Philosopher Award from the Society for Phil Women in Philosophy, and she's been a Fulbright Fellow. She serves on the boards of numerous journals, including Hypatia, Ethics, Political Theory, American Philosophical Quarterly, Public Affairs Quarterly, and last but not least, the Journal of Social Philosophy. Virginia, we're really delighted to have you comment. Welcome. Oops. Thank you, Carol, and thank all of you. I guess thank both Carols. <laughs> I am honored to be here talking about the ethics of care with Carol Gilligan. Gilligan is one of the people most responsible for identifying and naming 
the major alternative approach to moral questions that is the ethics of care. This alternative approach has been developed a great deal by moral philosophers since Gilligan's important and influential book In a Different Voice in 1982. And now, in my opinion, the ethics of care presents a huge challenge to the dominant and established approaches to morality and their associated political, legal, economic, and other thought and social organization. Moral theories are sometimes thought to be the to be the dismissible musings of philosophers, and it is often asked with contempt or sometimes sorrow, who listens to philosophers? But theories are often, such theories are often thought to be of marginal relevance to the realities of psychology, politics, business, everyday life. But the assumptions of theorists are the assumptions on which our, our societies and institutions and lives are built, and as they change, so does much else. One of the frequent criticisms made of the ethics of care is that it's too conservative, even reactionary. It's thought by some to reinforce women's traditional roles of taking care of others, and it's criticized for not lending itself to major social change. An example of this sort of criticism was Honora O'Neill's worry that, quote, a stress on caring and relationships may endorse relegation to the nursery and the kitchen, to purda and to poverty. In rejecting abstract liberalism, such feminists converge with traditions that have excluded women from economic and public life, end of quote. And Claudia Card wrote that, quote, more likely mistaken for a caring virtue is women's misplaced gratitude to men who take less than full advantage of their power to abuse or who offer women the privilege of service in exchange for protection. Women have assumed caretaking responsibilities as a debt of gratitude for such benefactions. But, Card continues, misplaced gratitude is a kind of moral damage women have suffered end of quote. Well, as Carol Gilligan's recent work shows, and as David Richards, with whom she has taught, will also show in his new book, and as many of us defending the ethics of care have been saying for some time, the view of the ethics of care as supporting the traditional subordination of women is really quite mistaken. What could be more revolutionary than upsetting the gender hierarchy of patriarchy in the most basic ways we think about how we ought to live and what we ought to do? Not revolutionary in the traditional way, perhaps, of shooting people who stand in the way, but revolutionary in the real way of changing how people think and feel about the most important questions they face. The ethics of care asks for the transformations of society, politics, law, economic activity, the family, and personal relations away from the assumptions of patriarchy and toward the world of caring and the kind of justice caring calls for. As Gilligan expresses it in her book, Joining the Resistance, quote, our exploration has led us to see the ethic of care grounded in voice and relationship as an ethic of resistance, both to injustice and to self-silencing. It's a human ethic integral to the practice of democracy and to the functioning of a global society. More controversially, it's a feminist ethic, an ethic that guides the historic struggle to free democracy from patriarchy. Gilligan's work interprets the attitudes of children, adolescents, and young adults. She hears the voices struggling to express themselves, and they are often quite hard to hear to someone like me who has no experience with this kind of inquiry. Gilligan describes a shift in thinking about psychological development from asking how we learn to take the point of view of others and to develop the capacity to care to what causes us to lose the inclination to care and what inhibits our ability to empathize? What we should be asking, she says, is how do we lose the capacity to love? 
Gilligan's observations show the falsity of various assumptions that we acquire from our culture and our courses, and then just take as given. Let's consider some of these assumptions. We can start with the picture of Habesian man, that we are individuals constantly in conflict and endlessly seeking power. The eloquence of Hobbes's language and the power of his words still ring in my ears. In the first place, he said, I put for a general inclination of all mankind a perpetual and restless desire of power after power that ceaseth only in death. It's powerful language. And it stays with us. This is a picture transposed to states in an imagined global state of nature. It permeates thought about international relations. Or consider the assumptions underlying pictures of economic man, a portrayal dominating our market-driven society. The picture that we always and everywhere pursue our own interests and can at best bargain with others to limit the ways in which we do so as we rationally calculate our interests. Feminists have shown the distortions in these pictures. Without caregivers acting in ways that contradict these assumptions, no infants would ever grow up to be Habesian men or, or rational calculators. The assumptions are assumptions about human psychology, and Gilligan's findings show them to be mistaken. Now consider the assumptions drawn from views of Kantian or Rawlsian man, rejecting emotional insight and telling us that we are or should be autonomous individuals seeking abstract universal laws of reason, or that we should contract with others from an imagined position of pure freedom and equality on rational rules all can accept. These pictures and assumptions distort the reality of what interdependent, relational, caring, actual human beings embedded in historical contexts are and seek or ought to seek. Gilligan's findings enable us to see how misleading these assumptions and pictures are, both as depictions of reality, as they are often mistaken to be, and also as depictions of what we should imagine as positions from which to think about our normative recommendations. Until they are inducted into the habits of patriarchy, neither girls nor boys are or aspire to be the self-sufficient rational individuals of these pictures. They are, as we all are, dependent and interdependent and shaped by and through their relations with others. They do not split apart reason from emotion or feel that close friendships are just for sissies. Gilligan writes that, quote, the separation of the self from relationships and the splitting of thought from emotion signal injury or responses to trauma, not the signs of maturity they have been taken to be. As she sees it, quote, the internalization of the gender binary and hierarchy of a patriarchal order forces dissociation. The binary creates splits in the psyche and the hierarchy undermines integrity and trust. So, as a healthy body resists infection, a healthy psyche resists this initiation. It resists moral injury, a betrayal of oneself and of relationships that is culturally sanctioned." End of quote. Her investigations show that at adolescence, it's patriarchy that leads girls to suppress their own voices and boys to aspire to self-sufficiency and power over others. Without patriarchy, both might be inclined towards the ethics of care as well as the ethics of justice. So it is not human nature that is reflected in the traditional assumptions about psychological development or in moral and political theories, but patriarchy. Well, what remains insufficiently clear, in my view, is what normative force these observations of psychology have. The actual tendencies of adolescence, as of anyone else, may always be ones we ought to discourage or redirect, such as tendencies toward cruelty or aggression. 
the components of an ethics of care must come from our evaluations of such tendencies. They cannot simply be the tendencies themselves. Gilligan assumes the values she labels human, love, cooperation, empathy, but this, from the perspective of normativity, is only a beginning. Love can sometimes be stifling or misplaced. Competition is not always bad or cooperation always helpful. Empathy can be misused or excessive. We need the judgments and evaluations of morality that we cannot find in the psychological study of attitudes. What needs more clarification then is what it means to overthrow the gender hierarchy of traditional ethics. From a philosophical perspective, we want to better understand the normative demands of the ethics of care. Moral philosophers who try to develop the ethics of care often seek the values embedded in practices of care, the actual labor of taking care of children and others in need of care, as we all are at various times in our lives and all the time in various ways. Practices of care call for sensitivity, empathy, trust, and especially responsiveness to need. They cultivate the development of trust and mutual understanding, mutual consideration. Care relies on the insights and motivations of the emotions as well as on reason. It values especially caring relations, not simply the dispositions of individual persons. Good care must respectfully and effectively meet actual needs. Actual practices of care need to be reformed or overcome their to, to, to overcome their deficiencies. They should be evaluated as much from the point of view of the care recipient as of the caregiver to understand how and when they're paternalistic, lacking in appropriate respect, or insensitive or inadequate, the social structures within which practices of care take place need to be radically transformed because of the hierarchies of gender, wealth, and power built into them. Issues of difference need to be approached with openness, receptivity, and honesty. Care should not be understood as self-sacrifice. Egoism versus altruism is the wrong way to interpret the issues in this context. Yes, the interests of a caregiver and care receiver will sometimes conflict, but for the most part, we do not pit our own interests against those of others in this context. We want what will be good for both or all together. We want our children and others we care for to do well along with ourselves and for the relations between us to be good ones. The whole framework of self versus other needs to be revised in this context. Caring relations are most familiar to most of us and can most easily be discerned and understood in the contexts of family and friendship. Whoops. Sorry, lost my place. But the ethics of care strongly rejects the relegation of its values to the private sphere of personal relations. The split between public and private and the relegation of women to the latter is at the foundation of the patriarchy that the ethics of care is committed to overthrow. Weaker but still caring relations can be seen and should be far more developed in the wider contexts of political and social life and global relations. The connections of civil society, much more appreciated in recent years than in the recent past, are understood as necessary for political and legal systems to function or function well. They, they can best be thought of as weak but still caring relations. For the rights of fellow citizens to be respected or their interests promoted, we have to care sufficiently about our fellow citizens to care that this is happening. This caring should gradually be extended to our fellow inhabitants of the globe so that we can live in peace with, our, with one another and so that the moral outrage of still widespread poverty is overcome. 
Thomas Poga is a philosopher who writes and crusades about the outrage of global poverty. 18 million people still die every year of hunger and poverty related poverty related causes while the world could easily afford to put an end to this suffering. He shows how only a little more than half of what the richest 1 20th of the world's population have gained in the past decades of globalization would have made it possible for the world's poor to have an adequate standard of living. If the most privileged had only gained a little less, then we could have gotten rid of the eight million people dying. Poga argues the case for alleviating global poverty in terms of human rights. We are violating the human rights of the world's poor, he maintains, by upholding the global economic order that brings about this poverty. However, rights are elements of law. Human rights are the standards actual law ought to assure. And world hunger does not lend itself well to legal solutions and remedies. The ethics of care, on the other hand, cries out for something to be done about seven million children under five dying each year of hunger or preventable disease. It would insist that their rights be honored. Poga himself notes that if the citizens of the de developed states cared about the avoidance of global poverty, and now I'm quoting, then so would their politicians and something would be done. The ethics of care as a normative guide is based on lived experience, ex experience open to all. We have all been cared for and most of us have provided care. But it requires evaluations and judgments, not only empirical findings. Even the best empirical, even the best interpretation, or even the best interpretations of empirical findings. So the work of developing the ethics of care continues. It is of great importance to establish that our capabilities for empathy, connection, cooperation, and responsiveness are considerable, considerable among girls and boys and men and women. It's crucial to know that a morality of care is not asking the impossible. As every beginning student of ethics is likely to understand, morality should not tell us to do what we are incapable of doing. But it should ask us to choose well. Gilligan's inquiries show us how the psychological realities to work with lend themselves to, rather than are mostly obstacles for, the ethics of care. She reassures us that overthrowing pa patriarchy, overthrowing patriarchy in moral theory is psychologically possible, even called for. It's now up to us to figure out what such a morality requires in all the different complex contexts for which we need it. Thank you very much. <laughs>